my um, ex-husband's house. Um, somebody has shot him or, or something's happened. He's, he's passed away. And you say someone shot him? It looks like someone shot him. There's a gun flying by his uh, left, left hand. Do we think he did this to himself? Well, ma'am, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I would hope not. Okay. You know, I mean... On March 21st, 2016, a woman called 911 in distress. She had just found her ex-husband dead in his home in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, and all signs pointed to him having taken his own life. However, after the police investigated the scene, they quickly noted something didn't add up. The body had been moved, the timeline was off, and new witnesses were popping up in a matter of hours giving contradicting information. A tangled investigation would uncover just how the secrets of this broken marriage had led Judith Nix to make the choice of murdering her husband Kenneth in cold blood. Kenneth Nix was born on September 19, 1946, and grew up in Louisiana along with his parents and his five siblings. As the oldest brother, he quickly learned what it was to work hard to help his family out, and he found his passion in mechanics. Ken loved motorcycles, and from a young age, he learned how to restore them. This passion turned into a career when he became a professional mechanic after graduating high school. Eventually, after learning the business, he opened his very own gas station, becoming one of the youngest service station owners in the area. Ken had an eye for business, and his hard work paid off. He quickly became successful, and the business he started from scratch was taking off. While his business was thriving, at the age of 20, he met the woman who would become his first wife, Monita Moriarty. Monita and Ken fell in love and got married in 1966. The young couple decided to move to Tulsa to be closer to Monita's parents, and it wasn't long before they started a family of their own. They had two boys and a girl, all of them very close in age. However, not everything was perfect in Ken and Monita's marriage, and after a few years of marriage, the couple decided to separate. His now ex-wife moved into an apartment with the three children, and Ken would visit on the weekends. But Monita was going through something else, something for which she didn't get the help she needed in time, and in 1974, the 27-year-old mother of three took her own life. Kenneth took his children, and the four tried to rebuild their lives without Monita. It wasn't easy, but Ken's children remember their father as a kind, loving man who taught them the value of hard work. At the time, Ken's businesses were doing great, and he was even expanding into new ventures. In 1980, he opened Inland Divers, a scuba diving business specialized in recovery missions and car accidents or natural disasters that required underwater rescue. This business, just like all of the others, proved to be a success. During these years, Ken continued to try and find love again, he was married three more times over the next decade, but all of the marriages ended after a few short years. His children didn't understand why their father changed partners so often, and he told them he was trying to find the perfect woman to become their mother, so their family could be complete again. And it seemed that in 1984, he found that person, and her name was Judith Bailey. Judith, or Judy, was a divorced mother of two. She and Ken met through their daughters, and although Ken was quickly infatuated by Judy, she was very reluctant to starting a relationship after being badly hurt in the past. Judy was originally from Texas, but had moved to Tulsa when she was a girl. At a very young age, she married the preacher's son, and the two moved to the countryside just outside of Tulsa. Judy found a job as an accountant, and the two started a family. They had two girls together, Angela and Shelley. However, their marriage wouldn't last long either. After a history of infidelity and heavy drinking, Judy had enough and decided to get a divorce. This difficult marriage affected her trust in future relationships, and even when she met Ken years later, she was still reluctant to starting relationships. She just didn't trust him. But Ken was falling in love with her, and they progressively spent more and more time together, and they decided to get married in 1985. Judy's teenage daughters decided to stay with their father to keep attending their school and not change their routines, while Judy moved into the Nix family home. Judy seemed to fit into the family perfectly. She got involved in inland divers as an accountant and helped Ken grow the business even more. They were a great match for business as well as for family. They had a lengthy marriage, longer than any of their previous ones, but eventually problems started to surface. Their differences were mainly centered around the way they raised their children and how they treated them now as adults. 
Ken felt Judy coddled her daughters too much and was very quick to give them money and help them out as soon as they asked her. He thought their children, now full-grown adults, should work their problems on their own as much as possible, especially where money was involved. He had taught his children to work hard, and he believed Judy's daughters should too. The tension between them grew as Judy kept financially supporting her daughters whenever they asked her for help, until 2011, when the couple decided to get a divorce. However, despite being divorced, the two found it hard to move on, and they kept a very close relationship. So close, in fact, that they'd still spend a lot of time together in their homes, as if they were still a couple. However, the tension between them is still there, so they would also end up fighting. Although they had divorced, they were still stuck in the same place they had been for years. Or they would be, until March 21st of 2016. My um, ex-husband's house, um, somebody has shot him or, or something's happened, he's, he's passed away. Okay, what's his address? Uh, what okay, how old is he? 69. Are we certain he's gone? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I dropped by to, to bring him some chicken for supper, and I'm his ex-wife, really. Okay. And um, we still hang out occasionally. And sure. Man. How old is he? Uh, what? Can you step outside? How old is he? He's 69. Okay, and you say someone shot him? It looks like someone shot him. There's a gun flying by his uh, left left hand. Okay. And it, it's uh, the best I can tell. I didn't want to touch anything. Sure. You're, you've stepped outside, correct? No, I'm... In right in the front doorway. Okay, could you step outside for me, please? Sure. Okay, we're certain he's gone. There's there's no. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I I know by looking that. Okay. He's gone. Okay. Do I need to hang on the line? Yeah, I'm gonna have you answer some questions for me. Give me just okay. a second, okay? Has he was? Been suicidal at all? Yes, he he's very despondent. He's got so many health issues that uh, neuropathy is getting so painful that he just can't deal with it anymore. Okay. He's and had prostate cancer surgery. He's had a heart attack. Okay. And he just can't hardly walk anymore. And he was Do we think looking he at did this probably too? getting into a wheelchair before too long, and he's okay. just so active. He, okay. He do, we, do we think he did this to himself? Well, ma'am, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I would hope not. Okay. You know, I mean, sure. Was I the, don't know. the door wasn't kicked in or anything when you got there, though. It didn't look like someone had broken in. No, but the back um, garage door was open, and he never leaves that okay. unlocked. Okay. Never. Okay. Hardly. He takes an Ambien, okay. and then he gets kind of loopy sometimes okay. before he goes to bed. But, but okay. that door was completely open in the back door um, going out into the sunroom okay. was what's, unlocked. What's his name? Kenneth Nix, and I ask. What's his middle name? Uh, Larry. And what's your Nick. last name? Nix, Judith Nix. Okay, and you had a key to let yourself in? Well, I've got a garage door open. Oh, okay. And uh, I just come and go, you know, we just sure. spend a little time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We don't get along full time, that's for sure. We were married about 26 years. I completely years, so. understand. <laughs> and where is he at in the house? He's in the master bedroom. Could you tell where the wound was on his body? I was looking, it looks like maybe in his um, left left side. His, here, his head? His okay. Judith Nix called 911 on the evening of March 21, 2016. She had just brought dinner for her ex-husband Kenneth and found him dead in the master bedroom. From the start, she mentioned all of Ken's health issues to the dispatcher, starting to suggest this had been Ken's decision. Police were quick to arrive, and when they did, they encountered a distraught Judy waiting for them. She was in a tremendous state of stress and kept telling officers how she knew this day was coming. Ken was in pain and unhappy. He suffered from neuropathy, a condition that affects the nervous system and causes large pain and discomfort throughout the body. According to Judy, he had mentioned the possibility of ending his life before. Judy's story upon the officer's arrival was that she had been with Ken the previous day and left after they had a disagreement. 
She said he was in a bad mood. But she hadn't heard from him all day, and after not picking up her calls, she decided to bring over some dinner and let herself into the house at around 9pm. That's when she found Ken on his bed with a gun under his hand. But before investigators could continue talking to her, the stress of the crime scene seemed to take a toll on Judy, as she began feeling unwell, so the 69-year-old woman was rushed to the hospital. While Judy was taken to the hospital, the police began investigating the scene, and very quickly they saw details that didn't add up with what Judy had told them. The state of the dry blood around Ken's injury suggested he had been dead for a while, probably since around 7 in the morning. This didn't necessarily mean anything, since Judy had mentioned she hadn't spoken to him all day and could have just found him at 9pm. However, it was Ken's injuries that caught their attention. They didn't seem self-inflicted. The medical examiner found not one, but two bullet holes within an inch of each other. One was closer to the eye socket, and the other one was on the temple. It was near impossible for a man to shoot himself twice in the head. The bloodstains on his shirt also didn't match the position the body was found in. Investigators were certain the body had been moved after being shot. Immediately they knew this was not a suicide. It was a homicide. The house was in order, nothing was out of place and there had been no forced entry. Investigators found a security camera in the kitchen, which partly pointed towards the bedroom. It was retrieved and sent to the lab for analysis. While the crime scene investigation was going on, Judy's youngest daughter Shelley arrived. Her mother had called her to come and pick up Ken's dog. While she was there, police briefly talked to her, and she mentioned something about stopping by the house that morning while her mom was there. Judy had mentioned she hadn't been there since the previous day, so police immediately raised a red flag, and Shelley Davis was asked to give a statement at the police station. During her questioning, Shelley talked about the relationship between Judy and her stepfather, and how Ken was a violent man. He pushed her mother around, threatened her, and had shown abusive behavior for years. Both Shelley and her sister were distant with Ken and didn't have a good relationship with him. That day, she said she had stopped by the house around 11am and her mom had opened the door. She was there to pick up some money she needed and never went inside. With the estimated time of death being around 7am, this would mean Ken was already dead inside the house when Judy opened the door to her daughter. Investigators started to piece things together and in all scenarios, Judy was looking like the main suspect. But since she was still being checked out in the hospital, investigators couldn't question her just yet. However, events were still unfolding, and the next day they received a call from an unexpected witness. Todd Moore, Judy's daughter Angela's ex-husband. Todd called the police, claiming he had information about the case. He said around noon on the day of the murder, Angela and Shelley showed up at his house telling him Judy had shot Ken. Todd said the two sisters were extremely nervous and they were seeking his help to cover up their mother's crime. They were even discussing Judy fleeing the country. Immediately, Todd told them he wanted no part in this and encouraged them to talk to the police and report the events. Angela and Shelley left the house, and he didn't hear again until the police got involved. That's when he realized they hadn't reported it, and they were trying to cover it up as a suicide. Todd's testimony gave investigators the insight they needed to understand the dynamic of this family. Angela's ex-husband talked about how the three women were extremely close and constantly supported and covered up for each other. The two daughters often relied on their mother for financial support, and their mother was always there to give them what they needed. At this point, detectives were not sure who could have pulled the trigger or why, but one thing was clear. Ken didn't kill himself. Shelley was kept in custody, and Judy was finally well enough to talk to detectives. From her hospital bed, Judy answered to investigators' questions. She described how Ken's neuropathy had been affecting him, and deteriorating his physical and mental health for years, making him angry and unpredictable. Investigators were clear with her, and they explained they knew this wasn't a suicide, so Judy had no other choice but to change her story. She told them it all started as a financial dispute. Ken was asking her for money, claiming he had been supporting her and her children for a long time and wanted her to pay him back. She also mentioned the alleged abuse she suffered from Ken for years, describing it as both physical and verbal. On the morning Ken was killed, she had gone to his house and they fought about money once again, but this time, Ken had reached for his gun and demanded Judy pay him back $20,000. Standing at gunpoint, Judy got scared and fought with Ken to get the weapon from him, and in the middle of this fight, Judy had accidentally fired the gun twice. Despite knowing it was self-defense, she said she panicked and went to her daughters for help. That's when they constructed this story, to attempt to cover the truth. 
Although this seemed like a more plausible story, there were still many details found at the scene that didn't match this new version of events. The most important one being the fact that the two bullet holes in Ken's head were too precise to be accidental wounds. The blood stains on his clothes also didn't match the position he was allegedly in when this happened. Not entirely convinced with this story, investigators charged Judy for murder and she was taken into custody immediately after being discharged from the hospital. Next in line for questioning was Angela. Both daughters had been involved in at least covering up the crime, as Todd had told investigators. However, Angela wasn't at home, nor was she picking up the phone for anyone. It took three days to find her. Police even considered issuing a warrant for her arrest. However, she finally came in and provided a statement. Angela began stating she knew nothing about the murder. She never went into the bedroom and never helped stage a scene. Investigators knew she wasn't telling the truth, so they decided to press her with information about the camera. Although the security cameras recovered from the kitchen had been mysteriously wiped clean, investigators bluffed and told her the camera was indeed operational and had been recording on March 21st. With this information, Angela went silent and immediately asked for a lawyer. Investigators weren't able to get more information from her then, but this reaction definitely confirmed she knew much more than she was letting detectives know. The three statements by Judy, Angela, and Shelley were full of inconsistencies and contradicting information. It was hard to build a timeline, but investigators were slowly filling in the gaps using the witness testimonies and the evidence to build a theory. Judy had pulled the trigger, and both daughters had helped her stage a suicide. However, had this been an accident like Judy said, or had it been premeditated? Investigating the allegations of domestic violence, detectives uncovered there had indeed been calls to the police in the past six years reporting violent behavior within the couple. But the cry for help had come from Ken, who had been calling stating his wife was trying to kill him. Next, investigators looked into the phone records between Angela, Shelley, and their mother, and they found the information they needed to fill in many of the gaps in the story. For weeks, the three had been texting about how much Judy hated Ken, and how he was refusing to give them the money they needed. Ken wanted Judy to stop coddling her daughters and giving them money, especially since a lot of that money came from Ken himself. On March 15th, Judy had texted Angela about a 22 caliber gun, the same caliber as the murder weapon. The motive was becoming clearer and clearer, but investigators reached out to Ken's sons to get more testimonies that could back up the evidence they were finding. Ken's son confirmed the couple were not in good terms, especially since Judy had been stealing money from her ex-husband for years, even before they got divorced. This was a constant problem, and Ken had confronted her several times about it, but that wasn't the only thing she was taking. Ken took several medications for his condition, and Judy had found a habit of stealing his pills. When he would confront her about it, she would gaslight him, making him believe he was so ill he was imagining things. That's why Ken installed a camera in the kitchen, and he had indeed caught Judy stealing the pills. Ken also didn't like Judy stopping by his house, and just the weekend before the murder, he had asked her to leave. He didn't want her there. Things were not good between them. However, killing him to steal his money didn't make sense. A look into Judy's finances revealed she was largely in debt, but it was Ken who provided the money she needed to pay them off, whether it was willingly or unwillingly. So then why kill him? That's when the key piece of evidence revealed the motive behind this crime. As part of their divorce settlement, Judy and Ken had agreed that the home they shared while they were married, where Ken still lived, would still be passed on to Judy in the event of his death. If Ken died, she would get the whole house and pay off her debt selling it. Judy knew what she was doing and why she had done it. There was no evidence that Judy's daughters planned the crime with their mother. They were just helping her cover up, so the prosecution decided to use Angela and Shelley's testimonies as witnesses. Therefore, they were not charged in the murder. In March of 2017, the trial began. The defense's strategy was to present Judy as an abused woman who was trying to defend herself, and this was initially appealing to the jury. Judy was a 70-year-old white woman who appeared defenseless. She was portrayed as a true victim in this case. The prosecution, however, wanted to prove that it was Judy who was dangerous. So much, in fact, she had planned to kill her ex-husband all along. In the early hours of March 21st, 2016, Judith Nix had let herself into the home of Kenneth Nix and approached him while he was sleeping. She shot him at a very close range. The first shot, although very severe, had not been lethal, so she had fired a second one closer to the temple. The second shot killed Ken immediately. 
Angela and Shelley testified against their mother, establishing the timeline of events and telling the jury how their mother had called them in distress, asking for help to cover up the murder. In exchange for this testimony, all charges against them were dropped. The jury reached a verdict in less than two hours. Judith Nix was found guilty. The facts were too clear to ignore. Judy had killed Ken in his sleep in an attempt to take his money. She was sentenced to life, and although she's eligible for parole, it won't be until she's over a hundred years old. Ken's children remember their father as a hard-working, loving man who shaped them into the people they are today. Sadly, their children will never get to meet their grandfather. If you found this video interesting, please like it and subscribe. We're on the road to reaching 100,000 subscribers and I'd love to have you as a part of this community. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one.